Okay, so um, let's start off the, um, the second session uh, of the genetics course, uh, the, the second class, and this is the second two and one, the Mendelian genetics. Um, before we go into um, the class, uh, I mean, there are some variety of announcements about the course. Um, as you know about the, um, the Q&A session, so uh, you can leave the questions or the comments about the course on the Slack channel, or you can use the um, Zoom link during the course that I can see your uh, questions, then, then, then we can give our feedback uh, to um, each questions. And, and also you probably found the link for the, um, the written assignment for um, the first, uh, the the half of the semester and also the second one because I uploaded the two things in the um at the uh, the blackboard so you can find the link and you can have the papers before uh, the deadline and that will I mean uh, immensely help your um, um the assignment preparation and from today we're going to uh, start off the the hereditary model. Uh, session and we start with the um, the Mendelian genetics and this is probably the model you are quite familiar with because we I mean most of the students already know this uh, model during your high school but we're not gonna uh, get into sort of um, the details and 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 the whatever the uh, Pone square style mathematics during this course because I mean that's not gonna really uh, meta in, in modern genetics and uh, I'm more focused on how Mendelian genetics developed um, during the history and also how this Mendelian genetics is linked to other um, genetic research. So uh, we're going to cover bits of the, um, the historical backgrounds of how people think about the hereditary and inheritance um, from the biological population and, and also uh, how modern genetics has been evolved and also introduced uh, from various models at, at the uh, late 90s and early 20s. Then I'm, I'm mainly going to discuss two models proposed by Charles Dyn and Gregor Mendel. Then we're going to deep dive into the, um, the concept of Mendelian inheritance and what is the basic principles, um, I, mean, I mean, which you might Lady familiar with, and then going to the implication of how Mendelian genetics is working in, in, in modern biology. And then lastly, we're going to um, discuss how Mendelian works has been rediscovered and also how it's been rediscussed in by other uh, peer scientists. You can have some um, sort of background chapters from the uh, textbook. Okay, so the first topic we're going to discuss is the historical views of heritage and, and inheritance. Okay, so the first, um, the um, hereditary model we can think about is the, the uh, brick and mortar theory by Hippocrates. So Hippocrates is probably the first person we, uh, the um, person who thought about the how um, the trait or the characteristic in, in um, organisms um, inherit to their offspring. And his model was at the time was brick and mortar theory. And that was the, um, where he postulated that the, the elements coming from different parts of the body, and then it concentrated to the male semen, then it developed into the uh, human being in the womb. In, in mother's womb. So basically his idea is the, the biological information collected from all parts of the uh, bodies and is um, accumulated in a male uh, semen then develops the sort of um, ultimate organism in, the, in, in, in mother's womb. So in the other words, in modern sense, we can think about this as like um, acquired uh, characteristic because I mean, this is sort of the very natural thinking that the, the traits are quite similar between the parents and offspring because the parents get the, the traits over the lifetime and it's uh, uh, concrete, uh, it's concentrated into, the, um, into some reproductive organ and it's uh, 
segregate to the next generation. So his view at the time was mainly sort of the theory, but uh, basically his idea is based on the applied characteristics. So for instance, like um, the Olympic players uh, who has large biceps uh, because of after his many rounds of his training, then this sort of the uh, biceps parts segregate in his semen and is uh, passed into the next generation, then ultimately his children would have some big biceps, right? So at the first uh, thought about the hereditary in, in our history was sort of the sort of like this part the characteristics. Then at the similar time, um, Aristotle has a different idea. So he basically criticized Hippocrates view but you know, I mean, if you know the philosophy, at, at, I mean, at the time of um, this, you know, Greek philosophers, they always like, you know, they criticize each other and they sort of uh, propose the new things, um, which is sort of the contradictory or sometimes complemented to the previous one. So anyway, the so Aristotle's idea is we call the uh, blueprint mode theory. So what what he suggests at the time. So Aristotle basically opposite to Hippocrates idea. So he, he thought that, you know, some people like, you know, having physical handicap, but they can have the normal children, right? I mean, now we know that why, I mean, it is, but at the time, uh, this is the sort of the counter uh, examples of um, Hippocrates view. So what he thought is that the people can transmit some characteristics to the next generation, but the at the time of the conception, the um, the characteristics is not really developed in his children. So, for instance, like you know, if you have the gray hair or if you have baldness, um, you know, hair patterns, but that's not gonna inherit to to your uh, offspring because you know we have. Um, we know that the it's not going to be the the inheritance pattern in, in modern genetics, right? So what Aristotle proposed at the time was he he thought that the 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 characteristics or the traits now we call it, is constructed by some the map, right? So we called it blueprint theory. So the transmission of the inheritance patterns is coming from parents to offspring, but their information is a symmetric model. So mother transmits some parts and father transmits the other parts. And this transmission is happening descriptively in, a, in, in different traits, right? So this is not really like, you know, the mix up of the acquired characteristic during the time, it's rather, um, sort of the uh, mother has its own inheritance uh, plan and also father has its own inheritance plan, then it merged into the, uh, merged that information into the, and into the children, right? But anyway, uh, either um, Hippocrates or the Aristotle, they don't really have the concrete idea how um, genetics is working in, in a trait because at the time, that just the, the mere discussion by whatever their thoughts and whatever they are uh, proposed. So it has to be more concrete and also more empirical evidence to develop that idea and to, the, uh, to, to describe the genetics, right? And afterwards, uh, people keep talking about some ideas about how genetics is working. So one idea at the time was, uh, um, the acquired inheritance proposed by John uh, Baptist Lamarck, Lamarck at um, 17th and 18th century. And at the time, people was quite interested about how um, the organisms has their um, traits after some generation and how this trait is uh, persistence across the generation. And Lamarck's idea was the sort of the gradual um, inheritance of the trait of the time. And this gradual inheritance has to be somewhat um, um, acquired during the lifetime of uh, the organisms and it has to be accumulated to the next generation. 
And you know, you're probably quite familiar with some examples uh, from the giraffe, right? So why giraffe has the long neck because it has the uh, it, the eating patterns on uh, the, the the top part of the tree, and it gets the uh, more used to do that, and and also ultimately the neck has been heightened uh, as the the tree size. And, and at the time, the biologist is the best explanation was about the um, genetics is like this acquired patterns. And I mean, they thought they can describe sort of, sort of the gradual patterns of the, um, the trait and how this trait is inherited in the, in the past. Then afterwards, uh, finally, we coming with the uh, two brilliant model about the modern genetics at, at late 90s, right? And one uh, person's idea was the blending inheritance, which is proposed by the Charles Darwin. And the other model is the particulate inheritance proposed by Gregor Mendel, right? And these two models proposed around quite similar time, 1868 and 1866. And these two models, they um, contradictory to each other and, and also in, in, at the end they complement to each other and it develops sort of the idea of the genetics now we have uh, for um, the biology in, in, in these days, right? Okay, so let's start off um, from the Charles Darwin's idea. Uh, Charles Darwin is probably one of the well-known person, um, I mean, by public, but also the biologist, right? So, I mean, he, he he's well-known for the natural selection. So Charles Darwin is quite, you know, first type person. He has many background, but one of his well-known examples is he, he took the long journey of the, um, the, the voyage uh, to different um, area around the um, um, the America and, and also Africa and, and, and Europe. And he, he explored so many different places and he explored um, many different species from the plants and animals. And he start, you know, developing the idea about the how this trait variabilities is exist in a population and how this variability is working in the population, right? Because, it, I mean, it could be quite natural because, I mean, if you travel someplace, then you see the differences uh, between theirs and, and ours, right? And this is same for the Darwin, right? So, I mean, he, he took an advantage of exploration and navigation, uh, um, the time, and he visited many different island and the places and he observed and he recorded things and he wrote the things to, you know, uh, wrote the letter to the, the, the society and it gets uh, attention because he discovered the new things and he described the new things and he's described the different things. And then this, you know, description about like, you know, variability and also different species in a different place is definitely some idea and also some of the interesting things to the, the society in, in Britain. And people, you know, I mean, like, you know, developing the idea about how, you know, the, the traits and inheritance is evolving in, in, the, in the society. And definitely, you know, Darwin was the one of the, you know, the main, main characteristics, you know, um, communicating that idea between the you know empirical situation and also the the academic society in in, in Britain at the time and ultimately he wrote the um the the you know majestic books called on the origin of species at 1959 and that was sort of the first idea about about you know the giving that the natural selection and evolution in in our population and this is the sentence from his book and how he summarized the natural selection from his observation. And he start think about how, you know, the, these, you know, the differences across the organisms and population is working in the, in, 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 in evolution and what is that meaning in, in our society as well. And I'm not sure how many people I read the uh, the on the origins of species, but 
you know, um, it, it has a several chapters and the half of the books is talking about the pigeons and pigs and horses because, you know, the, at the time of the Darwin, the, you know, the, the UK society was totally, um, you know, keen on the, the, um, the domestic uh, market about the animals and, and, and some plants because at the time that, that was, I mean, the paper's big hobby and, and people, you know, try to show off their, you know, fancy, you know, animals like, you know, as you see here, fancy pigeons, right? And they brought to the, the market or the personal meetings or private meetings and they show off to each other and they think about, you know, I mean, how, I mean, beautiful their pigeons are. I mean, I, I couldn't really <laughs> understand that, but at the time that was like, you know, their, um, their culture. And, and naturally, uh, Darwin and some biologists, they thought about, you know, how the organisms has that, that, that structure in the society, right? Because, you know, I mean, as to the, uh, the human context, uh, why humans has the class, right? Why humans has been evolved to have the class within the society? And that was more like a social science uh, questions at the time. But in the meantime, the biological sciences has sort of the same, you know, notion that, you know, why biological, um, you know, animals or plants, they have their, you know, the variability and why some, you know, the animals or plants are selected by uh, people, right? At the time, um, you know, like Lamarckian or other, you know, Darwinian people, they thought that there must be some advantages of the traits and that's why they've been selected by some, some force, right? And in this case, the nat um, natural selection. So Darwin's idea is not really, you know, merely based on the, based on his travel. I mean, his travel is definitely the giving him a um, empirical evidence, but in the meantime, Darwin's particularly interest also developing his idea on, on evolution. Okay, but um, I mean, he, he gave a really great things about the evolution and natural selection, but one thing he, he has the missing link between his idea and, 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 and inheritance was how this variability is inherited to the next generation, right? Because what he found in, from the um, natural population is that the traits are variable and traits showing the um, diversity across the uh, species and, and individuals, right? And this diversity has to be parented to the next generation, right? Otherwise, um, this diversity or this variation is totally lost in the generation. So his idea is basically the evolution is highly depends on the existence of heritable variability within a species. And he clearly mentioned that, you know, this, this um, variability is generated um, between the ancestral and descendant population. And he described that things in his book. But then people asked the question, Charles Darwin, how this variation is preserved to the next generation, right? Because he proposed that the variation is preserved uh, across the generation, but he didn't explain the exact mechanism how this variation is um, passed to the next generation, right? So Darwin proposed sort of the uh, provisional theory in his concluding chapters of the book um, in 1868, and he proposed the idea about how this variation is inherited to the next generation. And he thought that this is sort of the complementary idea to the uh, natural selection. Okay, so what was his uh, inheritance pattern? So his inheritance model called blending inheritance. So literally the traits are blended uh, uh, between parents and this blending in uh, traits is inherited to the next generation, to, to the offspring, right? So if you think about the, uh, let's say, um, weight. So if you, uh, if, if the man married with the, uh, the thin woman, the, the man is, I mean, um, not, 
uh, probably some some weight. Then the children's weight is somewhat, you know, between uh, the father and mother, or I mean, simply it's the average of the parents. So Darwin's idea at the time is that the traits of the um, offspring is determined by the trait value between uh, mother and father. So blending inheritance, I can simply put the formula that the offspring, um, the, uh, uh, the trait called ZO is the, uh, the average value of the trait of the mother and trait value of the father and divided by two. Right, and that was sort of the uh, backbone of the blending inheritance proposed by Darwin. Right, and the Darwin's idea is uh, based on the um, sort of um, the acquired and the blending patterns of the inheritance. So he called it pangenesis. Right, so pangenesis is the word uh, combination between the uh, pan and genesis. So genesis is origin or inheritance. It's the same meaning. Then the pun is that the, um, the, the traits inheritance is collected from the old parts of the body, right? So that means the pun. So his, his idea is that if you have some the trait value, let's say weight, then your weight um, inheritance factors collected from all of your body, then put it into your, uh, the, the male semen and developed into the, um, the, the mother's form, right? So this pangenesis and the blending inheritance idea was the dominant theory of the heredity before the discovery of Mendelian genetics, right? The reason is that the, um, the, the main society about the biology and natural science at the time was uh, Europe, definitely, and, and also the UK. And, uh, and uh, at the time, the, the Darwin's idea and also Darwinian uh, scientists, they heavily discuss about the um, Darwin's blending inheritance model, right? And they, um, as you probably saw the slides at the end, um, the Mendel's idea came into the early 20th because it's rediscovered. And then people start think about the Mendelian genetics, right? So basically the, the, the mid and late, um, the 90s people mainly discuss about the, uh, the blending inheritance at the time. Okay, so how blending inheritance is working. Um, so as I mentioned that this is based on the pan genesis and this pan genesis is the facilitate by gemmules, right? Gemmules is the tiny bit of uh, elements or circulate in our body, right? And this is the small thing and this is the additive things because it's not solely affecting on your traits is the sum up of the many things and, and, and developed into the traits. So it has to be additive, right? And also the, uh, the um, Charles Darwin thought that this gemmules is affected by environment because the, um, his idea is basically acquired uh, inheritance, right? And it has to be collected and also multiply in reproductive organs. Otherwise, it cannot pass to the next generation. And as I mentioned, that the gemmules and, and, and the blending inheritance is based on the acquired uh, characteristics. So gemmule was the sort of the core element um, that Darwin proposed at the time. Okay, so blending inheritance was famous in, in, in Britain in late 90s, but it also get lots of critics to um, the by by um, other scientists because you know science is always sort of the batteries of um, different ideas. Okay, so one critics from Fleming Jenkin. So Fleming Jenkin proposed that the okay, so let's say blending in our sense is correct. Okay, let's say that then the half of the variation is removed each generation, right? Because you add up the uh, mother's um, uh, trait value and father's trait value and divide by two, right? Because we calculate the average, right? Then that means that the half of the variation from mother or father is basically excluded from this process, right? And, and, and think about the situation if you, you know, repeat this, 
things many, many, many generations, then the variation persistent in the population ultimately decayed, right? Disappeared, right? So, okay, so different examples. So let's say if you have the two types of colors, uh, two, two colors of the water, right? So let's say you have the water, the colored um, green, and you have the water colored yellow, then you mix these two things, right? Then it's going to be somewhat green, yellow-ish things, right? And if you think about the old values like this, you know, uh, in, in, in our population, then if you mix that things over and over generation, that it will converge to the green yellow at the end. So in the end, you in, in your population, you don't have any colors other than green yellow, right? So this is the situation. So variation will be disappeared after these blending patterns, right? So that was the critics by Fleming Jenkins. Then another critics coming from his cousin, so Charles Darwin's cousin called, um, his name is Francis Galton. So Francis Galton has the experiment with the rabbit blood, right? So what he did is he transferred blood from the black rabbit and, and, and inject that blood into the white rabbit. So what's his expectation is that the white rabbit's uh, offspring should have uh, gray color but it doesn't have the gray color. We, we know that why, but according to the blending inheritance, because it's, you know, gemmules circulate the blood and these circulated blood uh, gemmules affected um, to the next generation. So Garten's experiment is perfectly designed for that, that questions, but in the end, it didn't turn out that, you know, the, the, the white rabbits um, with the the black rabbit's blood, not gonna have the gray color offspring, right? So this Fleming Jenkins idea and Gorton's idea uh, heavily criticized the uh, Darwin's model and Darwin responds to his, you know, provisional theory was, I mean, his theory is provisional and not really concrete um, in, given the, you know, empirical evidence and he, he responds to that idea into the nature. And then, then he, I mean, he, he, he insists that, you know, uh, gemmules not circulate the, in the blood, right? I mean, but, you know, this is not really sort of the um, perfect idea about the, um, the, the mechanisms of inheritance. So, um, I mean, now we know that the blending inheritance is not really uh, explaining our, you know, the principles of the inheritance, but blending inheritance is somewhat important in, in this modern genetics because the, uh, in, in terms of the, the characteristics of the additive and also the small parts, this is definitely have some great meaning on you know modern genetics, you know especially the population genetics and also the medical genetics as well. So blending inheritance is not really mechanistically perfect uh, compared to Mendelian genetics, but somewhat if you uh, if you think about the the heritability model or if you think about the um, the common variant or the rare variant we're going to uh, discuss in the next session. Blending inheritance is the foundational things we need to understand. Um, think about the um, variation uh, of the traits in our population. So please keep in mind that the uh, uh, which part of the blending inheritance is criticized, but also uh, you have to understand um, sort of um, the how the variation can be explained by blending inheritance in, in, in a natural population. Okay, let's switch to the um, Mendelian genetics. So Mendelian genetics is uh, more specifically, we should call it Mendel's particulate inheritance because the particle or factors is the, the main and core concepts of the Mendelian genetics, right? Okay, so 
what, what is that? The Mendel introduced a reductionist methodology to the study of the inheritance. So Mendel's uh, great implication to our biology is that he provides very reductionist uh, experimental methods to um, inheritance study, genetics, right? And Mendel proposed the laws of biological inheritance in natural population. And I mean, we, we're quite familiar with that laws. And what he did is Mendel studied the inheritance of the trait by controlled breeding of uh, about 30,000 you know, pea plants between 1856 and 1863, right? A very short time. And he presented his work in a Natural Science Society meeting in Brin in February this time, and he published his book after a year, right? That was quite short um, um, a timeline of his um, achievement. Okay, so first question, why Mendel interest in uh, heredity, right? So why people interested in heredity in, in 90s, right? Um, some people argue that the Mendel is a you know, full of curiosity of, you know, natural science. That's why he studied um, genetics at the time. You know, I and mean, we know the Mendel's, I mean, Mendel's job. Mendel is the priest. He is the religious person. He's, he served for the, um, um, the church. And, and I mean, some people say he's monk or he's priest, but anyway, he's, um, he's totally different jobs, right? But he's definitely working in a foundational work of the genetics at the time, right? So some people said, you know, Mendel was, I mean, so bored, so he cannot do anything without, you know, doing some, you know, the uh, P work or something, something. But um, I mean, we, we don't know why, uh, we don't know exactly why Mendel is interested in heritage at the time. But definitely one thing we can think about is the, the um, in, in 90s, the, the breeding is crucial for economy, right? The new, new types of plants, you know, better types of plant, animals, domestic things that will improve our industry at the time. Because, you know, think about the 80s and 90s, that was the great time of the navigation, right? So we travel different place, America, India, and we get the new things and they brought into the market and people, you know, they, they transfer and they, they do some economic work during, I mean, over that the new, you know, the merchandise things, right? And the breathing, definitely breathing was the uh, one of the key part of the economy at the time. And the Burin, Moravia in, in Austria, Hungarian empire at the time was the central place of, of the market, right? So that's why Mende probably um, easily introduced by sort of the breeding culture or the breeding situation and then he get into sort of that observation. Or a different theory, probably, you know, the, you know, um, the Mendel was the priest and he has to be fed other, you know, priest that in, in his church and he has to, you know, uh, breed um, some plants and peas and he can easily, you know, cook the things to his people. So that's why he got into the bread, but we don't know why. Uh, some parts curiosity, some parts, you know, the economic things or some parts, you know, his situation. But anyway, you know, 90s is sort of the place and people, is, you know, think about the breeding and, and how, you know, the organisms, natural organisms has their um, properties across the generation, right? Okay, so uh, Mendel's method. Uh, Mendel's method is, is quite well known. So we, we know that uh, it's about peas and it's about the shapes, colors, right? But Mendel's experiment is actually quite brilliant because the first thing is he chose the binary, binary traits. He chose the dichotomous traits. He chose very constantly different traits. And that's why he can emphasize the differences between, uh, between org um, organisms, right? Otherwise he couldn't do that because most, we know that the traits in, in our natural population is quite diverse. It's quite under the high levels of variation, but the um, traits uh, Mendel chose in his experiment is const constantly, you know, distinctly different 
with to an individual. So that's why he can uh, reduce his idea. He, 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 he refined his idea to the uh, uh, genetics experiment, right? And also Mendel choose seven different traits for his experiment, right? He, he's not just choose one um, trait for his experiment because he want to, he want to see his observation across many different situations, right? So this is the critical because the, you know, if you, if you see some observation in a, in a one situation, then it's not gonna be reproduced. It's not gonna be the same in other situation, right? So when you prove the new mechanisms or when you prove the new principles, then you have to choose the uh, many different things then you have to replicate between these things, right? So Mendel's experiment has really high value, not just, you know, uh, of the genetics perspective, but also of the, you know, experimental design. And, and even this is the quite valid in, in, in modern, you know, biology as well. Okay. And then, and then Mendel's method is also well known for the self and cross pollinating. And this is easy way to obtain progeny, easy way to obtain offspring, children, the same terms. And also you can expect uh, the phenotype of the progeny from the parents, right? Because you know the source of the, the inheritance, right? So you can expect the phenotype given the, um, the, the self appearance, right? And also you can apply this method to different parts of the uh, uh, pea plants and basically different uh, traits, then see the, the same, you know, see, the, see the research using the same experimental method, right? So this is the critical things. Okay, so what is the concept of Mendelian inheritance? So uh, we know the Mendel's law of inheritance proposed in uh, 1865. Uh, I mean, there are three laws, right? So laws of segregation, laws of independent assortment, and laws of dominance, right? Okay, so let's start off the uh, Mendel's expectation. Um, okay, so, and, and, and the expectation from the blending inheritance. So first thing I need to um, state that the Mendel did not did not know about the blending inheritance at the time because the there there was no link between the um, Mendel and and Charles Darwin's you know Britain society right so um, but just think about the uh, situation when the Darwinians uh, see the Mendelian um, uh, experiment at the first time so let's assume that we are in the uh, British society late nineteenth century then we. Uh, our expectation was uh, if you do self-pollination, uh, self-cross, then you have to see blended patterns of the trait at the first generation, which is the Villa 1, F1 hybrid, right? So let's say if you cross the white flower and red flowers, then you have some values between the white and, um, white and red. So somewhere between, you know, light pink, you know, the dark pink or something, something, right? So that has to be blended, right? But what he's, what Mendel saw at the time was quite different from blending inheritance. It is quite segregated and it is quite distinct uh, in, a, in, a, in, 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 in consecutive generation. So the first generation, uh, if you, uh, cross the violet flowers and white flowers, then you see only the violet uh, colored flowers at the first generation. And the second generation, you see, you, you, you return to the, the, the parent generation, like, you know, violet and white, right? So that pattern is clearly different from what we expected from the um, blending inheritance. And, and, and of course, we, we, know, we well know about the uh, Mendelian genetics and we, we, can, we can clearly explain that, you know, if you cross these two types of uh, colored flowers, then you have the one color and the second generation, you have the two colors, but the ratio is like a three to one, right? And then we now know that the, the three to one ratio is the Mendelian inheritance rule, 
right? But is that really true? Okay, so let's look at the original X payment from Mende, right? So Mende's ratio is not actually three to one. It's actually 54, uh, 5,474 to 1,850. So it's approximately 2.96 to one. It's not exactly three to one. This is critical, right? This is important things because, you know, we, <laughs> I mean, it, from the high school students or, you know, high school course or general biology, we technically memorize that, you know, Mendelian ratio is three to one, but it's not. Mendelian ratio is somewhat three to one. It's not exactly three to one. You have to remember this situation because the modern biology, we, we having the school, we having the skill called high throughput technology, then we describe the, the biological phenomena in a unmess, right? So in 70s or 80s or even 90s, we see very one dimension of the biological experiment, right? But now we see the great scale of biology and we see sort of the entire scale of the population, right? But surprisingly, that patterns is actually achieved by Mendel in late 90s, right? It didn't just look at only like three or four individuals from his experiment. He actually, he actually bred like, you know, 30,000 of different individuals, individual peas, and he counted numbers, right? And then he, he put it into the mathematics situation. Then he explained that the, how quantitatively measure that observation in, 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 into each trait, right? So he's not just recording one trait called C trait, actually recording all different parts of the traits, like seed colors, flower colors, flower positions, blah, blah, blah. And that is also quantitatively measured. And this ratio is not three to one, it's approximately three to one. Someone, I mean, some trait is over three to one, it's 3.15, 3.14, something, something. So the situation is that his measurement was quantitative and he tried to put it into that, that, um, that mathematical situation into his observation, right? So what we have to understand that the mandate ratio is, is three to one, it does really matter in, 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 this, in, in modern biology? I would say no, right? What we learn from the Mendel's biology is that he tried to do quantitative approach and he tried to achieve his idea from the observation, right? If you, if you read his, uh, if you read his book, he even really emphasized three to one ratio. He's more emphasized on the quantitative measurement of his observation. And that is the sort of the, the split and also the notion we, we kept in mind in, in, in modern biology as well. Okay, so let's talk about the first law of um, his observation. So from his quantitative measurements, the first thing he, he assumed that is that there must be the factors uh, involved in the inheritance, right? And that factors has to be has to be coming from each parent, right? One from mother, one from father, right? And each factor is segregated from each parent and put it into the offspring and it ultimately developed into the trait, right? And the time um, Mendel described the things, he used the term heritable factors. He didn't use the allele, right? Allele is the, um, you know, get defined in, in, in later stage, right? At the time he didn't know anything about allele or even not know about the gene, right? So he described the situation using the heritable factors. And the factors is like a particle. So, I mean, it, I mean, Mendel's idea is basically the originally written in, in, in German. So it can be translated into the factors or particles, but anyway, it's somewhat, you know, particulate uh, element. And the element coming from its parents and is put it into the uh, offspring, right? And the key things about this uh, situation, this process, uh, which is transmission, is the random, right? So random means that the 
the factors coming from mother or father has to be uh, come with the equal probability, right? So let's let's say that you know now we know that we have the two chromosomes and these two chromosomes uh, separate into the uh, single gametes and one of the chromosomes segregate to the offspring, right? And this segregation occur at the equal probability and also it happen randomly, right? This random perspective is the critical things you understand the genetics, inheritance, and also the trait. So please keep in mind that the, the segregation terms, you, what you have to understand that is, uh, the first one is Mendel proposed the fact idea, and the second one is the, this factors transmission happen at the random with the equal probability, right? Since there's no way we have, we, uh, there's no way, you know, against that the equal probability of the transmission in the segregation. Okay. And, and also the most important things about the segregation is the Mendel use genetic notation. Uh, and this genetic notation became convention in our field, right? So if you look at the, if you read the textbook, you probably see uh, Mendel genetics, like, you know, large R, small R, or sometimes large A, small A, or sometimes like A or uh, B, something, something like a two uh, constant uh, character, right? Mendel actually used the notation in his book, in his book at um, 90s, right? And this genetic notation, you know, is quite simple and, and simple means the powerful to, you know, used by other peer scientists. And now we can easily represent the, you know, the, these Mendelian factors by that notation. So if, if let's say um, each individual has two copies of the factors, now we know that it's a little, right? Then we put it uh, large R, large R, small R and small R. Then now we describe these are the homozygous. And if you have the different alleles like a large R and small R, then it can be the heterozygous, right? So this is quite powerful things. And that was the proposed by Mendel at the time. So, um, I mean, and, and also the one fun things about this notation or like, you know, quantitative measurement, uh, I mean, one, one curiosity you probably have in your mind is that why Mendel's idea is not um, emphasized immediately at the time. The reason is that the Mendel's proposal is too mathematical. And also, if you, if you read the Mendel's original book, you, you probably found that you know, this book is not just, um, uh, just uh, you know, whatever, um, just mere thinking. It's, it's more like a very uh, obvious and very mechanistical uh, description of the how uh, his quantitative observation is dissected into the, um, the mathematical principles, right? So at the time, the biologist is not really, um, um, you know, confident about the uh, uh, mathematics or physics. Uh, so that's why, you know, biological science is way behind the um, sort of the mechanical thinking, right? Because, I mean, they don't know how to use the mathematical formula to describe their phenomena, right? So Mendel's idea was that, that, that you know, characteristic. And, and that's why um, the Mendel's book is not easily written, uh, immediately written, uh, uh, sorry, uh, read by other uh, scientists at the time, right? But anyway, um, the back, back, back to the notation things, and that is the brilliant, you know, the invention, and 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 now we all use that things. Okay, and also the Mendel proposed his segregation idea using the Bono hybrid cross, and now we know that this is the um, the um, the trait is working on uh, uh, work by uh, one locus, right? So uh, one trait, and he uh, demonstrate that uh, segregation pattern using the monohybrid cross. And I mean, um, um, uh, nothing really uh, new in this slide because we know the, the probability of the uh, Mendel's uh, genotype uh, ratio uh, for each uh, situation, like an homozygous, uh, uh, the dominant, 
uh, phenotype and heterozygous and homo homozygous recessive uh, phenotypes. And that will ultimately produce three to one, approximately three to one ratio of the phenotype, right? And, and again, segregation, it means that the each gamete receive one or other factors with the same, you know, the, um, the same probability. And then the, we, we easily uh, uh, calculate the, uh, the probability of this uh, segregation. Now we can use the Punnett square, right? So Punnett square, I mean, it can work in a mono hybrid cross or um, uh, the hybrid cross we discussed in the later situation. So the Punnett, uh, I mean, at, at the time Mendel proposed this idea Punnett even, I mean, didn't born at the time. So Mendel didn't anything you know, know anything about the Punnett at the time, but you know, later the Punnett developed the you know Punnett square, and we can easily calculate how Mendelian uh, genetics work in a in a in a trait. But you know, again, the the calculating Punnett square is, I mean, I mean, I, I don't know why we have to do these things in an a university exam because I mean now we can use the calculator or even the um, the new machine called computer. So, I mean, we don't have to, you know, memorize these things to your exam preparation. But, but surprisingly, some students didn't take the course and, and ask the question, you know, how to calculate the punish care. Yeah, I mean, that is quite, you know, um, exciting moment uh, as a <laughs> professor in this course. But, you know, I mean, you don't have to uh, know about the how to calculate Punnett scale because this is quite obvious and also I mean you, you probably you know deadly doing this during your high school I mean I mean you know you're not going to do these things anymore in during your lifetime because you know we can all computerize these things into the programming language so <laughs> yeah but anyway okay so why Mendel's idea is quite revolutionized because the uh, you know 16th 17th century or even like in the 18th 19th century, people still believe that the, you know, how, I mean, people, you know, developed uh, in, in mother's womb, right? So they, I mean, some people believe that the little man in the sperm, so they, they call it homunculus, right? And this little, you know, tiny things is developed into the, you know, human in, in the womb. And that was the idea, but it's not really true because the sperm has only the half information of the trait, right? And the last half is in the um, X, right? So now we know the, you know, <laughs> separation. Hopefully you don't really believe this anymore. And also uh, the important implication about the segregation is that this segregation idea is later supported by the uh, cytologist. So cytologist is the scientist who studies cells behavior, right? Cellular behavior. So around the 19th century, um, the, the light microscopy or lens skills is immensely developed at that time. You know, you know, Nikon or whatever the, the German, the, the fancy lens things is actually developed from this area and people observe the new things from our body and, and the cells and even like your sperms and eggs was the one of that, those things. And from that, the cellular behavior, especially the germ cells, people start think about the how the Mendelian factors is behavior during the uh, meiosis, right? So cytologist is the one of the people actually uh, appreciate the Mendel segregation idea and this segregate of the uh, single gamete is working during the meiosis and fertilization and it's working in the, in, in the offspring traits, right? There was the one implication. And then after that, the Mendel segregation idea is later supported by the chromosomal theory. And that was sort of the revolutionized the, the, the uh, Mendel genetics and linked to the cellular biology and, and also even the molecular biology as well. And the Walt Sutton and Theodore Boveri was looking at the chromosomes behavior um, during the meiosis. And then they uh, um, radically uh, uh, introduced Mendel's idea into the uh, meiosis model and he 
they propose that the Mendel's hypothetical uh, factors, heritable factors, unit factors is actually the chromosomes, right? And these chromosomes is working in the inheritance situation uh, and, and then the Mendel's uh, inheritance is working at the end. But later, this chromosomes idea is further developed by Thomas Morgan, right? And, and, and he bring into the, um, the Mendel's factor into the gene level or a little level. And then this idea is ultimately uh, represented by a nuclear sequence, which is now we're looking at by uh, high throughput genomic technology, right? That is sort of the flow of how Mendel's idea developed from original thoughts to the latest genomics um, technology. Okay, so Mendel's second idea is the independent assortment, right? So the Mendelian factors is transmitted independently and this transmission is not gonna affect two um, different traits, right? So one trait is uh, determined by one, um, um, heritable factors, and the other trait has to be uh, transmitted by other factors, right? So there, um, I mean, the traits, two traits not influence to each other, right? That was the idea of the independent assortment. And for this idea, he used the hybrid cross and Mende um, clearly explained uh, using the, the hybrid cross and the, the ratio uh, combined by two uh, traits. And then uh, when he designed this idea, he, he again used the um, uh, contrasting hypothesis. So the first one is the trait is independently developed in the uh, organisms or dependently uh, develop the organisms, right? So if the trait is independently developed, so that means that the the ratio of the two traits is not going to affect each other, then the trait has to be have the 9331 ratio. But if that is linked to each other, then the, the ratio has come up with the three to one because the two traits is actually mediated by the same factors, right? So two, two situations are different, but as you see in the previous slide, Mendel used the dehybrid cross and he successfully showed the 9331 ratio and the, the, he proposed the independent you know, assortment of the um, trait. Okay, but later now we know that the, this independent assortment has the exception. So independent assortment is actually working, but some situation it has few exceptions. And now we know that this is the linkage, right? So some of the alleles or some of the Mendelian factors are closely linked to each other on the same chromosome, right? In that case, these traits could have different ratio as Mendel get at the time, right? But think about the situation Mendel at the time, Mendel didn't know anything about the chromosome. He didn't know anything about meiosis. Even he didn't know anything about genetic linkage. That's why, you know, the independent assortment at the time described by Mendel was the best thing. But now we know that the linkage is uh, rare and it present, uh, you know, frequently in the in, in biological um, individuals. And that is definitely a fact on our inheritance as well. And we're going to discuss this, you know, linkage uh, issue in a later section because this is the key things uh, between the Mendelian genetics and Thomas Morgan's uh, molecular biology introduction. And then also it's linked to the uh, haplotype concept in a population uh, genetics. Okay, and the third law is the dominance, right? So dominance is, um, I mean, it's well known about the, uh, the Mendelian genetics because, it's because of the analogy, but um, dominance is more technically we need to describe in this way. So a single allele or a single Mendelian factors may be dominant over one allele, and but recessive to another, right? So once that allele is the dominant of one allele, then that going to dominantly determine the phenotype, right? So that is the sort of the raw idea proposed by Mendel, right? 
Okay, so uh, think about in this more dominance layer, then we had to come up with some uh, important terminologies like genotype and phenotype, right? So genotype is the combination of the uh, two Mendelian factors. So in this uh, context, two alleles, right? So we have two alleles. So one is the B1, B1 allele for brown eyes. So B1 alleles is dominant of a B2 allele. And B2 allele for brown or uh, blue eyes, and this is recessive to B1 alleles, right? So if we combine these alleles, then we can have three possible genotypes, right? So first one is the B1B1, which is the homozygous, and that will have the brown eye phenotype, and B1B2 heterozygous genotype, and that one has the brown eyes. And the third case is the B2B2 homozygous genotype that will have the blue eyes, right? And these colors is representing the uh, phenotypes we can have from these alleles, right? So um, if you think about the dominance, the first implication in, in the genetics history was the think about the um, disease patterns in, 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 in human, right? So uh, um, we, when we look at the dominance of the alleles, we can, we can easily uh, judge the presence or absence of the phenotypes within the family members, right? So we can think about you know, animal or crop breeding, or we can use the human disease research. But at, at the meantime, I, 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 as I mentioned that the genetics, uh, Mendelian genetics particular, as, um, is quite heavily influenced the uh, medicine uh, at the beginning of the 20th century because of the uh, Archibald Garrett uh, work at the time. So what Archibald Garrett uh, proposed at the time, one of his patients has the interesting um, the clinical traits. Um, the person has the black urine and the black urine is the, um, in obviously the phenotype. And, and the Garrett was quite curious because um, none of the uh, parents has the pattern, but the, the children has the, the black urine, right? So he collected the entire family and then he traced whether the trait is inheritance, right? So this grand generation has the, uh, the grandmother has the black urine pattern and the mom has it. So, I mean, it, that's okay because mom has it. Then this person, this, you know, the uh, second daughter doesn't have the black urine pattern, but then the, the, uh, the father didn't have that one too, but the, the, the child has that the patterns, right? So it doesn't really matching that idea about the black urine things, right? So that was the, the Garrett original idea about the, um, the patterns. But then he realized that this uh, pedigree information is not correct because um, this, probably this, persons, this person has the heterozygous, like large A and A, and that person has the small A and A, right? So that can have the different allele patterns. So it has to be small A and A, small A and A, and that has to be heterozygous, and that has to be heterozygous. And then, then these kids can have the, the recessive patterns, right? So Archibald Garrett uh, also uh, actively introduced the idea of the Mendelian genetics and put into the, the explain of his uh, patients into the Mendelian genetics patterns. And he concluded that the black urine patterns probably follow the recessive patterns uh, from the pedigree, right? Then, then he started to curate all sorts of the uh, inborn errors of the metabolism. And he curated that idea into the book and called it Inborn Errors of Metabolism. And he published in 1909. And that is sort of the foundational work of the medical genetics in, in our history. Okay. And this Archibald Garrett idea is after 30 years, it's refined by the one gene and one enzyme concept proposed by Biddle and Tatum. And that is probably you're going to learn this idea in the molecular biology or biochemistry. And that is the first idea about the 
how gene and the protein is protein is connected to each other, and that is further refined by the uh, central dogma idea and in, in mid 20s. And that now we have the open words for the molecular biology and, 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 and molecular genetics. And that is sort of the idea of how, how molecular genetics have followed the Mendelian uh, inheritance idea into the, uh, in modern days. Okay, so last part of the, uh, the course is the rediscovery of Mendel's work. So as I mentioned that the Men Mendelians uh, or the, uh, the scientists who think the Mendel's work is, is, is awesome. And they, they rediscussed the Mendel's work at the late stage um, around the late 90s and early 20s, right? So Mendelians, as I mentioned, they are the scientists who believe the Mendelian rules are correct and lit. And, and, and mostly the Mendelians are botanists who study plants or cytologists, as I mentioned, who study uh, cells. And, and some, you know, the main uh, key characteristics. And they, they actually, at the first time, they really doubt on the uh, Mendel's idea, but they, uh, they, you know, reproduced the Mendel's experiments and they came up with the, the same conclusion as Mendel's experiment. Oh, I missed them L here. So, I mean, I, I can fix that. Okay, so then they believe that Mendel's work is actually um, working and Mendel's idea is the, the fundamental things in the uh, trait inheritance, right? And as I mentioned that the cytological techniques like a microscope development or search of development is heavily influenced of this rediscovery situation. Okay, so what rediscovery means in this, uh, in, in our days? I mean, Mendelian is not just saying, wow, Mendel's work is lit, but other than that, they actually start, you know, inventing the new terms, new vocabulary for the uh, new situation, which is the Mendelian inheritance, right? So Hugo de Vries introduced a term called uh, mutation, right? So this mutation idea is, I mean, we're going to discuss in the later section, but mutation is somewhat the new forms of the, the species and the uh, individuals, and that has the different phenotype, right? So Hugo de Vries is the, the avid fan of the um, the uh, mutational theory, of radical evolution uh, in, in, in the human population, uh, the natural population. So he wants to introduce the new types of the things uh, according to the Mendelian factors, right? So that's why he introduced that term. And the Wilhelm Johansson, he introduced a term called gene, uh, which meaning the offspring and genotype, the genetic materials of organisms and phenotype the visible traits of that, that organisms. And the William Batenson also coined the term called allele and also genetics as well. Okay, so that was one of the uh, early letter you might want to read. Okay, so um, what I want to empathize the one slide, if I choose the most, uh, the critical things in this uh, slide, in this lecture, I would pick up this one. Okay. So allele is a key term for genetics and also the key term for this course, right? Okay, so textbook definition. So allele is the different forms of particular gene, uh, uh, particular gene, uh, okay, so I call alleles, right? Okay, this is, okay, this is okay definition. Okay, so alleles of the gene for C shape are W for round C shape and small W for wrinkled C and to, to this annotation alleles because they are alternative for to do that, right? And alternative alleles typically represent by the same letters or combination, blah, 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 yeah. Okay, so this is the text definition and this is, I mean, it's okay, but this is not intuitively correct in the modern genetics. And, and you should ask why. And if you, if you have the question why, then that will change your, you know, entire, you know, the career. The reason is that the most of the situation allele you learned in the molecular genetics or, you know, the modern biology in, in, in university is it's almost equal to gene, but the allele is not equal to gene. They are totally different concepts. 
right? Ali could be part of jinn, but it's not the same concept, right? It, especially in the context of the molecular biology, right? But if you're just uh, merely reading the genetics textbook, the allele and gene is in play, uh, even in the introductory uh, sections, even, even described like, you know, Mendel knew the allele or genes, but that is wrong. I mean, Mendel didn't know anything about allele or anything about genes, right? Even the early scientists didn't know anything about that, right? But somehow it's <laughs> described in that way, right? So in modern genetics, alleles are actually a change of DNA sequence. You need to know these things, right? So then the questions followed by this sentence is that how we define change, right? How we define change, which change, right? So, I mean, as I mentioned, the DNA sequence, but anyway. And, and then change means that you have to compare something right, compare with something. So compare to what, right? And this is the critical things. And we're going to discuss this, you know, sentence, quote, I mean, in, in the consecutive um, sections, right? And also you should ask that what are changes, right? What are changes within our DNA sequence, right? That is the allele is, has to be understood in the modern genetics, right? So you shouldn't be confused with the terminology genes with alleles because these are totally different ideas. And also for Korean students, genes and alleles translated in Korean in uh, quite similar words, and that is totally wrong. The reason why the translated words is wrong is that the allele and genes translated in, in mid centuries, right? So mid-century, we didn't know anything about DNA sequence. We didn't know anything about, we didn't have any sense of the genomics and DNA sequence. That's why people didn't know anything about the alleles at the time. In that time, allele and the genes is essentially the same concept according to the Mendel genetics. And we didn't know anything about molecular biology, right? So be cautious about how you take the allele concept into your understanding, right? Otherwise, you you fail to understand the genetics meaning in these days, right? Okay, so that is my sort of um, uh, key slide. And, and, and you, we can quickly uh, recap the, uh, the today's uh, class with this summary session. And, and also we continue to discuss the, the foundation of modern genetics uh, from Gregor Mendel, Francis Galton, and Ronald Fisher is in, in next class. And next class will be, I mean, a probably amazingly difficult mo to most of the biological students. So you should read the slides and have the question before the class. And otherwise you cannot follow the flow of the Mendelian genetics to the uh, biomet biometric genetics. I mean, I, I would say some of your students they think, you know, I, I know the Mendelian genetics, so I can skip this breathing, I can skip these things, and I can follow whatever, you know, in the exam. Um, those students, I'm 100% I'm, I'm guaranteed that you're not gonna get the good scores because you're not gonna follow the flows just before the exam. So you have to link your flow between the Mendelian genetics to the next class, which is the biometric genetics. And for that, I would bring you to the one question for the next time. Okay, so the question is that if Mendelian genetics, Mendel's law was true, how could it explain the traits like heights by dichotomy, right? This is the question. So now we know that the height is heritable, right? Tall father has tall child, right? But if Mendel's work is correct, how we can explain the trait like height, right? Because height doesn't have the binary trait. It has the continuous trait, right? So keep, in, you know, keep this sentence in your mind and, and raise the slides before the uh, next class. And I mean, it, it's always welcome to bring your questions to the class or to the Slack. Um, I mean, I'm, 
I'm, I'm, I'm here for your questions. So, um, so hopefully you learn and also expand your understanding from these discussions as well, right? Okay, so I think our time's up and see you next time. <laughs>